And so this is the grand evolutionary tree of life. And I've just talked about it as if we are looking down through from descendant to ancestor, but I want to now look at it from ancestor to descendant in the direction that time actually occurred. So the genetic history of life is shaped as a vast evolutionary tree, which branched as species diversified. Now, it's a little messier than this, like there's issues near the root about horizontal transfer and so forth, but in broad uh, uh, brushstrokes, this is the shape of genetic history. You are here. The spiders are there. Bacteria are there. Plants are there. Everything we see around us is somewhere on this tree. Uh, even viruses presumably came somewhere from somewhere on this tree, possibly many places. Uh, we might look at our neighborhood a little bit more closely. You're there. There are the mammals. We might look at the spider neighborhood, in particular the jumping spider neighborhood. There are some jumping spiders. So we can look at particular sections of this evolutionary tree. Now, I want to say that the evolutionary tree plays a central role in modern biology, and I'd love to explain more, but that's a whole talk, to explain how the evolutionary tree plays a role in modern biology. But I want to just explain it a little bit from two perspectives. One is the very simple, intuitive one, that genetic origins matter hugely to organisms and how we understand and explain them. The other way to think about it is going to be by an example. Uh, and um, uh, I'm going to talk about eyes, and I'm going to basically point out that as all you, you all know, we take inspiration from nature. Would, how soon would we have flown, uh, built airplanes, if we hadn't known about birds? Uh, uh, nowadays, we look to plants for cancer drugs. There are many ways in which we look to organisms for inspiration for things that are practical to us. Let's suppose you wanted to look to the vertebrate eye for inspiration as to how to build visual systems, cameras, robotics, whatever. Um, so we look at a, at, at a vertebrate eye for inspiration because after all, this thing has evolved over many millions of years. Uh, there's been a lot of chance to fiddle with it. Maybe it's going to have figured out solutions to issues that we haven't yet found those solutions. So we look at it, but the problem is it's really hard to tell when we look at the way that it's built, which of the features are there because they're the right way to do it, and which of the features are there because of accidents of history and the fact that these organisms, as they evolve, are constrained to tinker with the genes they were given. And so there are many aspects of organisms that are imperfect. And they're imperfect because a species inherited a certain set of things, it was presented with a challenge, it couldn't actually evolve to get the perfect solution, but it could tinker a bit and get something that was OK. Right? So when we look at this vertebrate eye, how many of those features that we look at are good solutions and how much are basically just suboptimal things that are as good as it could get given the history that it had? The problem is what we'd really love to do, of course, is to do a grand experiment where we make a batch of Earths, a thousand Earths, we populate them with animals without eyes, we let them evolve for 100 million years and see each one how they come up with the solution of making an eye. But we can't do that. We can't wait 100 million years and make a thousand Earths or something. But we'd love to have replicates nonetheless, because if we have replicates, we might be able to see which are the features that really matter and which are the features that are just accidents in the history of the particular group of vertebrates. But we have replicates. One of the replicates uh, is the cephalopod mollusks, so the octopus and squid. They have a, an excellent visual system. Another one are the jumping spiders. They've got an excellent high-resolution visual system. The insects can count, too. It's rather a different structure, but we can think of that, too. The key here is that each one of these, by looking at what's similar across these different visual systems, we could see, for instance, what are the features that might be there because it's the right way to do it and are novel solutions. What are there just because of accidents of history? And the way that we could distinguish the two is partly by having replicates. And what the evolutionary tree does, it tells us what are the replicates. It tells us these things are separated on the evolutionary tree. They evolved independently. So the fact that the tree tells us that they're independently evolved tells us what are the replicates in nature's experiments so we suddenly can understand what's independent, how can we, uh, what, can, what can we treat as being something interesting in common. So that's sort of the quick way of thinking about how evolutionary trees matter. Okay, so let's get back to our theme about median apophysis. Spiders are here. Here are the jumping spiders. Let's focus on them. So we're going to look at the jumping spider branch of the evolutionary tree. So this is just a subsection of the whole thing. Uh, and it turns out that most jumping spider species belong in one great big sub-branch, I'll just call it a branch from now on, of the evolutionary tree of jumping spiders. Uh, and I've shown that as the sort of cream-colored ones. 
But there are a few that fall outside, few jumping spiders that fall outside. They're still jumping spiders, they fall outside that major branch, and those are the blue ones I've shown here. The big group, the major branch, has about 5,000 described species, very diverse. The other, group, the other groups that are outside of that have only about 250 species known, and they're not particularly diverse in body forms and so forth. There are two special genera outside this major branch, in the blue area, as I've drawn it, called Cocolodes and Alicocolodes. And they're only in New Guinea, and they were what attracted me to New Guinea primarily. They're special. In fact, after this paper was published in 1982, I would just sort of, I'd look at it. I'd, I'd, it was a dream forever to see one of these things alive, right? This is such a weird jumping spider. It's a great thing. Uh, it's something that I've always wanted to see. Partly because of the fact that it's in, the, it's, it's unusual, it's outside of that major group. How do you tell them apart? It turns out that species in this big branch have no median apophysis. For some reason, this moving part on the male palp was lost in evolution at the base of this great big branch. Which means that if it has a median apophysis, it must be in the blue area. Okay? And so what that means is that when I saw that median apophysis, I knew instantly two things. First of all, it must be outside the major branch. And remember, there were only two things, it turns out, known in Papua New Guinea that ha had the median apophysis. Those are the two I just showed you. But not only is it outside the major branch, but it must be a very distinctive new lineage that we've never seen before, because I knew pretty well what was in that, in the blue area, and there was nothing that looked like this. Um, so before the expedition, this is what we knew from Papua New Guinea. We had these two things, Alicocolodes and Cocolodes, two genera, they had median apophyses. I was really glad to see them, I collected them, that was great, we got fresh specimens, we could do more studies with them. But after the expedition, we not only found this one at the left, the little brown one that I've been telling you about, but we also found a couple extra. The one at the upper right and the one at the right um, that also have a median apophysis. So from a point where we knew about these two isolated genera, isolated in the phylogenetic tree, suddenly there's this whole little radiation that we discover with things that are distinctive enough because of the fact they're on the separate branches here that we can call them new genera. Uh, and it turns out that the names that I gave uh, to them, I got to name them, right? You find new things, you get to name them, uh, are, uh, come from the local word for spider. So Kukudeta is named after Kukudet, the Hewa word for spider. Uh, Yamangale is named after Yamangale, the uh, Ipili word for spider that was caught in a different area. Uh, Tabuina is named after the Kwari word for spider, Tabui. So I guess if you travel around New Guinea, you can find 800 different ways to say spider. I didn't do that. So, okay, so sure it's cool to find something new that's on a separate branch and so forth. They're distinctively new species that we found from sparsely populated places, parts of the evolutionary tree. But in a sense, it's from a scientific point of view, apart from simply the novelty, how is this useful? Like, why does it matter to find these things from a different area of the evolutionary tree? Oh, by the way, I don't know if I've said it. I, the word, the, our technical word for the evolutionary tree is called phylogeny, and the word might come out of my mouth by accident, okay? I wasn't intending to say it, but it might pop out by accident. Um, so here's why it mattered so much to me. If we want to learn something about the early evolution of jumping spiders, what happened near the root, and we might, for instance, understand the evolution of these eyes, how did that fancy visual system get put together in the early evolution of this group? Then finding a new species in this big branch would be cool, but it wouldn't give us much new independent information about the early evolution of the group because there's so many other known species that already speak for that branch. Uh, it's a little bit like finding another species of mouse. We, we already have so many species of mouse, it's not going to tell us anything about the evolution of early mammals to find another species of mouse. But if we find a new species in the blue area, where there's very little known, uh, it could give us much new independent information about the early evolution of the group, because there's so few species, so little information uh, from those branches. Uh, and that would be a little bit like finding uh, a new species of monotreme. So you know that among the mammals, there are a couple that lay eggs still, and they're in a separate branch from the rest of the mammals, the platypus and the echidna. To find a new species near Platypus and Echidna, especially one that's pretty different from the other, from those two, would be so spectacular because it could tell us something really new about the early evolution of the group. So finding something in this blue area that's pretty new is, 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 is special in the same way. 